right, so our next speaker, her name is Sharonda Williams Tech. She's currently an environmental state coordinator for the Sierra Club in Washington, D.C., and she's going to talk about a project that she's championed when she worked with an organization called We Act for Environmental Justice in Harlem. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Sharonda Williams Tech. Hello, my name is Sharonda Williams Tech. I would like to first start by giving a shout out to Mahiar. Mahiar is the one that recommended that I speak at this year's Zero Waste Summit, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> I am honored today to be amongst leaders in this field and especially to be in a room filled with so many people that work hard every day to create better communities, which in turn creates a better world for all of us. I was asked to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've considered myself to be an environmentalist since the age of 14. I took a really amazing marine biology class my freshman year of high school, and it taught me many things, but the most important lesson I learned was it taught me that as a human being, I had a responsibility to be a steward for this earth and all of its inhabitants. I'm lucky enough to be married to an amazing man who shares my values in environmentalism and also in social justice. I am the daughter of an immigrant that has shown me an example of what it means to be a strong woman, um, but also that I can accomplish anything that I strive for in this life. Thank you. I thank my mom. <laughs> Professionally, I am the environmental justice state coordinator at the Sierra Club. Um, my work is focused on climate justice issues, and I work on climate justice on the national level. I have focused areas in Illinois, Michigan, and the great state of Minnesota. So give up to Minnesota. <laughs> um, I have been working in the pursuit of environmental justice for the, the past six years. And so when I think of zero waste as an environmental justice issue, I think of people using their limited income on reusable, non-toxic products that help them save money while also reducing health risks. Additionally, less waste, less toxic waste in the waste system means less of that waste goes into garbage burners, which are disproportionately cited in communities of color and are low income. I've been lucky enough to work with an amazing coalition based in Minneapolis, the Hennepin Energy Recovery, um, Hennepin Energy Re Recovery Center, the, the HERC Coalition, they're working to, to shut the HERC down. And we've been working to make sure that Minnesota does not include waste incineration in any plan they put together to combat climate change in the state and in this world. I've been working um, in environmental justice for the past six years. I started my career in 2010 at a grassroots EJ nonprofit called We Act for Environmental Justice. I worked on climate justice as well as toxics reduction issues. And my work encompassed engaging with community members locally in West Harlem, um, working on toxics reductions and climate um, legislation in the state of New York, but also working on stronger federal protections. My favorite part of that job was, was definitely interacting and working with the community, but also figuring out that there was definitely a bridge between community engagement and legislative action. I would do these town halls in West Harlem where I would talk to people about the dangers of toxins in their personal care products and in their household products. Um, we would talk a lot about chemicals of concern, brands of concern, um, safer alternatives to purchase, but also how people could support and advocate for laws that ban those chemicals in New York State. At that time, we were working on a bill to ban bisphenol A or BPA in sippy cups, baby bottles, and pacifiers. It took six, six years to get that bill passed, but we, we finally did it that year. And what I learned from doing these town halls was that when people are informed, they are then empowered to make positive changes in their personal lives. They can then use that education to create legislative changes, which create changes in larger communities. When it comes to being an informed consumer, there are many resources that people can look into when it comes to figuring out how to reduce toxins in your household and in inevitably in the waste stream. I'm gonna speak specifically about cosmetics and personal care products because if I went into all the products available that had toxins in them, I'd go way, way past my 10 minutes and, and be cut off. 
So there are two great resources that, that I love and that I look to. Um, one is the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, and the next is the Environmental Working Group's Skin Deep Cosmetics Database. The Campaign for Safe Cosmetics has a fantastic website which includes relevant regulations, chemicals of concern, but also information about a program called the Compact for Safe Cosmetics. The Compact for Safe Cosmetics is an agreement that was entered into with hundreds of companies where they agree to not pick chemicals in their products that are banned in other countries, to disclose ingredients information whenever possible, and also to not include ingredients in their products that are known to cause cancer and or birth defects. The Environmental Working Group's Skin Deep Database allows you to search for over 64,000 different products, which is fantastic. And when you put a product in, you can see whether that product has a low hazard, moderate hazard, or high hazard based on the ingredients in that product. And they also speak to you about safer alternatives that you can purchase as well. So like I said, it's important that we are empowered to make changes in our personal lives, but if we want to you know, expand that into changes for everyone, we have to look at what laws we have available. Minnesota is awesome. I, I did a lot of research about Minnesota laws and toxins, and Minnesota is definitely a leader when it comes to regulating the safety of cosmetics and personal care products. In 2013, Minnesota banned the use of formaldehyde in children's products, which includes baby lotions, bubble baths, bath soaps. And I'm sure many in the room know that, you know, Johnson Johnson was one of those companies that families use for generations, and they had formaldehyde in their baby shampoo. They have since removed it, and now it's just called a new formula. They're not acknowledging that they're now taking those toxic chemicals um, out of products that are being used by children. Minnesota is the first state to ban intentionally added mercury in cosmetics, making it stronger than the federal standard, so that's, that's huge. And yeah, give it up. <laughs> and also triclothin, which is, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, triclothin is a registered pesticide which is found in antibacterial hand soaps, dishwashing liquid, toothpaste and cosmetics, um, is going to be banned effective in Minnesota in the year 2017. Um, yeah, this is all great news. <laughs> um, yes, that, that's, that's, there are a lot of good things going on in Minnesota. You guys are definitely taking the charge when it comes to you know, regulating the safety of your citizens, but with, with anything, you can, you can do more. How can we raise the bar in the state of Minnesota and make sure they're protecting their citizens even more? Well, like anything else environmentally based, you can look to California as, as a model. Yeah, right? <laughs> So in, I believe, 2005, California passed state legislation that um, looks at regulating the safety of products, but also the way that information is being disclosed. The California Safe Cosmetics, Cosmetics Act requires manufacturers to disclose ingredients to the state if they are found to be on a state ban or federal ban list, which is great. So this information then goes into a database, and this database is then accessible to the public. So though the state isn't banning these chemicals in the products, people are able to see this information and make more informed decisions as, as consumers, which is a huge thing. So in a nutshell, we can see that our federal government is not doing a great job. Um, states are really taking it upon themselves to protect their own citizens. And so I wonder what you guys think. Do you think that this is a problem in other countries, or is this a, you know, a US issue? Hands up if you think that other countries are doing a better job. So I'm going to talk about Canada, and I'm going to talk about Europe, because they're doing a much better job. Um, they're kicking our butts. So Canada is doing a much better job when it comes to regulating chemicals in cosmetics and personal care products. Health Canada, which is the federal agency that is um, required to look after the health of Canadians and improve the health of Canadians, is constantly researching and looking at, at chemicals and seeing what has health risks. Um, once they ascertain that there's a health risk in a chemical or a contaminant, they either restrict or ban that chemical in their country. Um, health Canada also has a cosmetics, um, not cosmetics, a, a chemical hot list that has hundreds of chemicals which are, are banned in Canada, and two of those chemicals are formaldehyde and triclothin, which are not banned in the United States. Um, health Canada also requires manufacturers to disclose ingredients information and also to register any of their, pro any of their products. So, that's a huge thing. The European Union is also doing a fantastic job, much better than the United States. The European Union um, created a law back in 2003, which was revised in 2013, called the European Union Cosmetics Directives Act, 
Within that act, they ban 1,328 chemicals that are known or perceived to cause um, cancer, reproductive development issues, um, birth defects, et cetera. Um, compare that to the US FDA that has banned 11, I repeat, only 11 chemicals in the United States. So we have you know, very, very far to go. And so I talked earlier about you know, my favorite part of my job at WE Act was looking at that, that bridge between um, you know, how do we get people to change their personal behaviors, but also how do we then take that education and turn it into legal change? And so, you know, Minnesota is doing a great job, but Minnesota can be doing even better, and we have to do a better job when it comes to our, our federal protections. And that really takes people power, but also takes political power. And just to wrap up and to answer the last question that was answered of us, you know, what's something that we want to learn more about and what's something that's a challenge to us? And for me, I think the people power piece is really hard. And I look to you know, the organizers that I know in this room, like Mahi Arjanith, and I'm sure there are many others who, who really do that work to really get people corralled around an issue. People have jobs and kids and other things that take priority, and so for me it feels really hard to add on something else for them to kind of put their energy into. But this is an issue that you know, really affects our daily life in the short term and the long term, and so we really have to you know, come together and speak to our friends and families when we go home today about what we learned in this presentation, all the presentations, and all the you know, dialogue that you're having, and let people know that they have to feel empowered to lift their voices up and to make change in their lives, make change in their states, make change in their countries. And if we all work together, we can be a part of the change that we want to see in this world. Thank you.